through the heat, through the furnace. But the worthless metals melt off of those precious metals. So, so trials, your trials, are like a furnace to you, smelting off the dross, revealing the precious metals of who you really are and more importantly, who God intends for you to be. Often when believers go through trials and, and our faith is tested, some believers attempt to then walk away because I'm gonna say it here, I know we're church, I'm a pastor, but trials suck, okay? You may just wanna turn to your neighbor there and tell them, hey man, trials suck. You know, they do. There's nothing fun about trials unless you consider them pure joy, then it changes everything. It's a different way to look at all your struggles, all the suffering. So trials are like a furnace that tests whether your faith in God is real or not. It's not if you face trials, but James says when you face trials. In other words, you're going to face them. If you're breathing, you're going to face some trials. I know Jesus said it like this. Jesus said that the servant is not greater than the master, right? He's not above their master the servant's not and so if Jesus suffered you and I we're going to suffer okay the Christian life is not there's no way in the Bible where it teaches that the Christian life as soon as you give your life to Jesus you're saved born again whatever Bible phrase or term you want to put on that experience that commitment you make of your life to, to Jesus that right after that everything's going to be smooth everything's going to be rosy there's not going to be any troubles from then on that's just not true at all that's a lie. In fact, sometimes there's more because Satan wants to keep you down. He wants to keep you from what God intends for your life even more. At this point, when you're a light on the hill, right? When you're salt, he, he wants you to be hidden, right? He, he wants to keep you in the salt shaker so you don't have any influence on others. And so the believer's life is not one without suffering. Just as Jesus suffered, we are going to suffer, but, but it can be a, a life when we do have trials where we can consider those trials, those struggles, joy. We're going we're gonna to get to that in a minute here. So trials are like a furnace that test us. We shouldn't be surprised when they happen. Instead, we should be prepared and be ready. And so we're going to take a little time this morning to try to help prepare us, right? Lesson number one, a huge, huge part of being ready for the trials is to be in community with other believers. Acts chapter two is one of our passages that we unpack with our five habits. Well, Acts chapter two was written about the church at Jerusalem who James is writing to. How they were in all one accord. How they were together almost every day in pockets all throughout the community. How they were serving one another. How they were, it's always best to do life in community because life is better together it just is so how can we face trials of many kinds number one consider your trials pure joy instead of getting overwhelmed and being filled with sorrow so you have that choice like I said trials suck and sorrow will always come with suffering but if we let it overwhelm us and we focus on it let it capture our mind capture our heart then there's no way that we can consider it pure joy. See, the language here means consider it pure joy. It means deliberately make a choice. Don't just, well, if I feel like it, eh, if I feel better tomorrow, I'll, I'll do this. That's not what we're teaching here. That's not what James is telling his congregation. He's saying, no, you've got to deliberately, consciously make a choice to choose joy and to see beyond the sorrow to what God might be bringing into your life is a reward of the trials yes we're going to go through the trials and yes there's going to be some sorrow but don't let it overwhelm you don't fix your eyes on the suffering fix your eyes on the Savior see beyond the suffering see beyond the struggle and, and see what the reward is going to be, how he's going to develop you, how he's going to build you so that you're capable over time of doing all these great things God has in store for you. Your suffering equips you to be a good father. Your suffering equips you to be a great mother. 
Your trials make it. They shape you so you can be a good husband, wife, man, woman, student, boy, girl. It helps you to understand yourself. Your trials help you to come to know yourself. Your struggles help you to know your strengths and your limitations. Your sufferings equip you to do everything you do much better. I want you to realize that perseverance and full maturity can be the result of your trials. Trials turbocharge the ordinary process of spiritual growth. Isn't that good? It turbocharges that process. God didn't make the world with suffering. He created as the Garden of Eden as a perfect environment. But it's mankind's choices. And God had to give us a choice if we're truly gonna have the ability to love him freely with a free will, have relationship with him with a free will. And yet he knew that some of our choices are gonna be less than what he desired. We're gonna fall short of his standard of perfection in our choices. And he knew that. So before the foundation of the world began, he started a plan in motion. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, it doesn't say that whosoever cleans his life up. It says that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Everlasting life. And that life starts the moment you believe. In fact, I want to tell you that life starts in prevenient grace before you even come to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is drawing you, John says, to the Father. Prevenient grace, keeping you from injury and harm before you even get saved, before you even decide. God is walking, preventing things from happening to you that would thwart his plan later on in your life. It's called God's prevenient grace, preventative grace in your life so that he can get you to the starting line so that you can now experience his saving grace over your sin and your shortcomings, over my sin and my shortcomings. And from then, his grace doesn't just save you and forgive you. His grace begins to empower you so that you can consider every trial, every form of suffering that you go through as pure joy. What a different way to think about your circumstances. It's life-changing. It's revolutionary. And that's why James is teaching his congregation these things. So how do we face trials of many kinds? We consider our trials as pure joy instead of allowing them to fill us with sorrow. We're going to be sorrowful. We're going to be sad. But don't let it capture you. Look beyond it. See beyond the sorrow to what's coming, what God's doing. Number two, believe the testimony of your faith produces perseverance. Believe this. Believe this and be looking for it. Let's look at verses three and four. It says this. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance or endurance. Some uh, translations say verse four. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let it, let it, let it. Don't fight it. Don't fight it. The uh, word for perseverance, or some translations, endurance, is one of my favorite words in the New Testament. It's hupo meno. It's a two-part word. It's a compound word. Hupo meaning under. It's a preposition. And meno meaning to remain, to remain under. But the language doesn't mean just to remain under grumpy and sorrowful and sad and down in the pit. It means to be able to stand up under it. To stand up under it. Hupomeno, it means to be able to abide under, to stand fast as you're abiding. It refers to the ability to bear up under a burden. It is the staying power, the empowering power of the Holy Spirit of the Christian's life. Let me say it this way. It is the ability to shake it off and step up when a load of trials is dumped on you. To shake it off and step up. See, our trials work perseverance that completes us. There was an old story about a guy that fell down into a well in a village and they didn't have a backhoe or anything to go try to rope him out of there and stuff and all they had was a shovel. 
It's all manual, just a shovel. And so a group of guys who was his friends, he was way down there, he couldn't reach him, so they just started throwing dirt on top of him. And he kept getting frustrated. Man, God, quit, quit dumping dirt on me, you know? And they keep doing it. I said, no, no, it's for your good, it's for your good. What do you mean it's for my good? And they're shoveling more and more dirt, one shovel full at a time. It's hitting him in the head, and it's, you know, he's trying to get away from it. And every time dirt comes down, he steps up on the dirt, and more dirt comes down, he steps on the dirt, and they keep throwing dirt on him. And man, piling it on, dumping it on. And eventually, you know what? He just walked right out of the well because he had the uncanny ability, the supernatural ability to step up while he was under the burden and the trials falling on him. See, this is the power of God in a person's life that shapes them so that they can continue to stand and step up. It's the development of Jesus not just you believing in him and knowing a little bit about him but you trusting him to where he becomes your foundation your anchor your anchor in your life John Eldridge tells a story of a Scottish discus thrower and I figure since it's Olympic season let me share this story from me this guy was Scottish discus thrower from the 19th century and he uh, lived days and days before there were professional trainers and, and uh, digital development of his skills. And he was there in the Scot- Scottish Highlands all on his own. And he made his discus from uh, the description that he'd read in a book. And what he didn't know is the actual discus used in the Olympics, right, in those days was uh, wood that had an outer rim of iron around it. And so he made his own discus, but he made it of pure metal, four times heavier than the ones used in the Olympic Games in his day and time. And this committed Scotsman trained day after day after day, laboring under the burden of the extra weight. In fact, he went and marked the distance of the world record. And he kept practicing and training until he could take his discus and throw it to the length of the world record. Now, he didn't know his discus was not made out of the right material. Of course, when he arrived at the competition, he was handed the official wooden disc with the iron ring around it, and he just threw it like a tea saucer. I mean, wow. Okay, I need some help. <laughs> I actually used to throw a discus in high school. But anyway, that was a long time ago. And he threw it like a tea saucer, right? In fact, he set new records, and for many years, none of his competitors could even touch his records. And his elders reflected on this story he said so that's how you do it you do it by training under a great burden you do it by training under trials your trials are not to bring sorrow although they do your trials are to develop you and I to burn out like a furnace to draw us in our life so that we can Go further, higher, farther in God's will in our life. It's training for us. And some of you here today are training under a great burden right now. Man, I tell you, we're receiving training and it hurts. It's unpleasant. There's no doubt about it. Sometimes we despair. Sometimes we cry. Sometimes we get frustrated and angry and we scream out at God. God's big enough. He can handle that. But don't lose sight of the purpose of persevering and how that perseverance, that, that ability to stand up under and step up and shake it off, step up and shake it off. What it will do in your life is radical. It will develop such a character standing on who Jesus is. Let's take a look at uh, verses five through eight now. Let's keep moving on, five through eight. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Verse six. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Verse seven. You can, you can get the title slide out of there if you would. Okay. Such a person is a double-minded and unstable man in all the ways, okay? Um, such a person is double-minded and unstable all I do. So how do we face trials? We consider your trials pure of joy. We believe the testing of your faith is actually gonna have a reward to it. And then we ask God for wisdom, which is what these verses are saying. And as you ask God, you can't do it in a doubting fashion. Now, what does that word mean? It means don't be double-minded. Well, what is that? That means that you have divided loyalties. Don't be divided in your loyalties. Now, here, here's the bottom line of the message, okay? 
You might say to me, hey, Pastor Ed, I'm loyal to God. I believe in God. And I would look at you and say, I know you do. I know you do. And so do I. I believe in God, and I'm loyal to God. You would say, hey, Pastor Ed, man, I go to church, and I try my best to worship. And I'd say, absolutely, and I do too. But that's not what this passage is talking about. It's talking about taking your loyalties and being divided with them. So in other words, let me illustrate it like this. Say you have this person that comes into your life. It could be a man, it could be a woman. And they've made such an impact on your life that you've begun steering your life towards that person. In fact, if you looked at your finances, you see that you're spending money on them. If you look at your calendar, most of your time is spent with that person. I mean, this person has now captured the majority of your loyalty, okay, and is the main person in your life. And so everything that you have is based on them, it's directed towards them. But what happens when they are no longer around? What happens when they're gone? There, there isn't anything left. So, when we talk about James and divided loyalties, and you wind up with a person or a career or a family members, that wind up being more important to you than God, when you lose that, you don't have anything left from which to build. You you don't have anything left. But, but, But with God, it's totally different. So you have the choice. What he's saying is don't divide your loyalties. Don't divide your loyalties in such a fashion that you put anyone, anything before God. Jesus says in a story form uh, back in the Gospels, he says, hey, when you're building your life, when you're building your marriage, when you're you're building your family or your career or whatever it is that you're building, don't build it on sand because sand is shifting, right? It can can be gone in a heartbeat. It can be washed away. and, And when it's washed away, you're left with nothing. He says, don't build it on sand. Instead, build it on the rock, and a lot of times people will describe it what does it look like to build your your house your life on the rock well I want to take and and say what does it look like if you build your life on the sand there's nothing left because that what you're giving to that what you're depending upon that which is giving back to you your foundation your anchor when it's gone it's gone that's not how Jesus is that's not how God is Romans chapter 8 if you want to read that from 28 verse 28 to the end of the chapter we don't have time this morning Romans chapter 8 talks about God and his love towards us. How that he fights for us. And because of who it is that's fighting for us, we're conquerors and we don't even have to fight. And that it goes on and on and on. It says nothing can separate you from God and his love. So no matter what trial comes along, no matter what person comes in or out of your life, no matter what career you have or don't have now, the one constant unchanging in this world is Jesus and the foundation and the anchor that he can build what he can become in your life it's beyond my imagination I look at myself when I was 17 years old and I'm 60 now and I look at what God has done in my life there is I'm telling you there is absolutely no way I could have lasted through the storms that, that my life has gone through and the trials and the suffering had it not been for an anchor that has held me fast. You know, I close with this. There's so much more of the passage here. It really all comes down to who do you love? Do you love God more? Are you gonna continue to allow space in your life to continue to love God more than everything else? And when you do that, he becomes that anchor. It's just not a savior. He becomes an anchor in your life so that when temptation comes, see, your desires, my desires, There's good desires, there's unhealthy desires, there's healthy desires, but all your desires can be a distraction from the one desire, to love and serve God. And when that happens, and you give yourself to those desires, then you don't have anything on which to stand when those desires give up on you, when they run out. Let me close with this story, because it's it's time. Um... My wife and I used to have a, a, like a wakeboard boat years ago and we would take our kids out uh, in, on the lakes and stuff and we would do a lot of boating because we, we discovered 
that, you know, if we go to the baseball games and stuff, they could be anywhere. I mean, it's simply four, five, six fields. We, we can't keep up with them. They're hanging out with friends and other people and stuff. And so, you know, when teenagers get keys in their hand and stuff, it's, it's hard to see them. I mean, it's, it's like all of a sudden you don't exist as much. I mean, you're, you're good for paying their car bill. You're good for the food on the table and keeping food in the refrigerator stocked, right, all that. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. But, but there's not a whole lot of time. And so we thought, how can we, how can we take and have time with our kids? And so we bought a boat. And we'd take their friends with them, and we'd go out on the middle of a big lake boating, and guess what? They couldn't get out of the boat. I mean, they got on the boat to ski and tube and all that stuff, but they, they, they wouldn't swim to the shore. They would always come back to the boat. And so I had the keys, and so I determined how long we would be with them. You hear what I'm saying? Brandon spent a lot of time on our boat. In fact, twice I think we pulled his shoulders out of whack on tubes. With the, you remember that? Yeah, it was crazy, right? Good, good times. Well... <laughs> It was. He would say it's good times too. Trials. They're producing character, right? As they wrap the towels around him in the hospital and yank his shoulder back in place. It's literally what he had to do. <laughs> anyway, so, but we sold that boat, and my wife and I, we have grandkids now, and we thought it's time to buy a boat because our grandkids are getting a little older. You know, we, we learned teenagers, it's like herding cats to try to keep them together. So we bought a boat. So we put them on the boat. We're thinking the same thing with our grandkids. We want to teach them how to fish. So we bought a I was just going to do a very cheap, small little little bass tracker boat, and uh, had it all picked out. I wanted three holes in the in the bow so that I could I could sit and have a grandson here and maybe a granddaughter here, and they're fishing, and I'm showing them how to you know hook. They don't want to hook the worms or whatever. I'm hooking worms. I'm showing them how to fish, and maybe my sons and son-in-law can help you know teach their kids how to fish while I'm in the boat with them or in a boat in a lake. They can't get away. You you see the picture, and so I talk to the salesman in Springfield Bass Pro and, and he's uh, all got it it's got everything I'm looking for and, and a few weeks later I go to pick it up at their warehouse and I walk in the warehouse and I look at it and they say are you at Callahan I said yes I'm at Callahan here's your boat I said oh great that's not my boat I said yeah it's got your name on it here's the paperwork here's the number and model number that's all. I said no that's not my boat it doesn't have three holes in the front for my grandkids right it doesn't have well lo and behold it was a wrong boat what, what was described for me doesn't exist, what they sold me. And so the guy said, listen, I know you've driven four and a half hours. I know you're going to go to the lake and drop it off, and you're all doing all this one day and going home that same day because I only have so much time to get this done. And he said, so I've got this other boat. And so I went from a, a small bass tracker to this large Ranger, bigger motor kind of boat that's got the three holes in it. It's got a... a two nine-inch fish finders on it for about $2,000 more. So some of you all that know the difference, it's like, oh, my soul, are you kidding me? Yes, I've been out in it once. We've taken our grandkids out, and they were able to sit in the seats and everything else. And my son-in-law, Travis, is in the front of the bow, and he's operating this trolling motor. And uh, he says, hey, Ed, did you know you have an anchor on this boat? And I said, had no idea I have an anchor on this boat. I didn't buy an anchor and put it in the boat. He said, no, 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 it's right here. It's this button. I said, button? It's got a little anchor symbol on it. And he steps on it, and that old trolling motor starts going, woo, 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 woo. you know, I'm thinking, what in the world is going on here? And the boat's just staying, right? It's, it's, being, it's being held in place. No matter what the winds blow, what the rains come, based on GPS, Bluetooth, evidently, this boat I wound up getting has a GPS anchor in that pedal, and you step on that button, and the anchor holds it in place no matter what storms come. Listen, some of you don't have an anchor like that in your life right now. And you need the Lord Jesus. Trials are coming. Are you in it? Your marriage is on the rocks. You don't know where to go to school. You don't know what you're going to do next. You just lost your job, your career. And there's nothing left because you built it on the sand. I'm here to tell you today's a new day for you. Today's a new day for you. Today could be the first day of the greatest decision you ever make in your life, and that's to give your life to Jesus Christ. And learn how he can be your firm foundation, your anchor, your rock upon which you can stand. And no one can take God and his love and his foundation out of your life. No one can get rid of it out of your life. He doesn't come and go and come and go and come and go. He's not with you when you're up and not with you when you're down. He is with you. He says, I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you, thus saith the Lord. 
He loves you. And it is the constant that you can have in your life when you're being tossed to and fro. And through him and learning his ways, you can find out how to consider it pure joy and how to remain under that and keep stepping up and shaking it off and have the joy of the Lord. The Bible says the joy of the Lord, consider it pure joy, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. There is so much strength and power in the joy of the Lord, but it's a different way to live. And I want to invite you to the Jesus way today. Would you all stand with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. This is the most important time of the service if our prayer counselors can come down. If, if you're burdened with a load that's heavy, listen, it's better. Life is in community together. Come on down to one of these prayer coaches and they'll pray over you. They'll take that burden to the Lord with you, for you. And they'll not just pray this morning. They will add you to their prayer list. They'll check in with you. So if you need prayer, come on down and be prayed over. But if you need to make the greatest decision of your life, and that is to invite Christ into your life, you come on down and take my hand or take one of these counselors' hand and say, I'm here to make the greatest decision of my life. And they will celebrate it with you. Father, we give you this time as we lift our voices one more time to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.